people privileged to play a role in the coming of Christ into the world are placed before us by St. Luke in this gospel passage today. Of course, that includes Mary and Joseph, but also now Simeon and Anna, who are given the prophetic insight to recognize this otherwise ordinary-looking infant for who he really is, and to understand the implications now of his presence in the world, that he will expose the hearts of many. He will facilitate the rise of some, the fall of others. But to any awaiting the promised redemption of God's people, he will always be a cause of joy and thanksgiving. And so the vision comes to pass some three decades in the future a day neither Simeon or Anna would ever live to see. So in the meantime, we are told that this child, the Christ, is taken by his parents to Nazareth, where under their tutelage and care, he is going to grow in wisdom and strength, and it will be evident that God's favor is upon him. And then in his late 20s, or early 30s, he will emerge from those hidden years to conduct a public ministry in which everything ever foretold of him will be fulfilled. And while we are able to know much about his public ministry and the surprising means by which he would accomplish our redemption, But today, the church is inviting us to focus on the hidden years, although we have little or any knowledge of them. All we can know is that Christ, like all of us, was raised in a family, certainly one that included his mother Mary, who conceived him under unusual circumstances and brought him to birth, and her husband, Joseph, who would willingly play his part as the foster father. But while the issue is still much debated, the Gospels themselves, in particular St. Mark, suggest Jesus had brothers and sisters, which, if you consult the Christians of Nazareth, To this very day, they will tell you that those were his older stepbrothers and sisters, children of the widower Joseph from his first marriage. So while we know Jesus was raised in a family, it may well have been a blended family. And step-siblings may have played an important role in those hidden years been his babysitters, his companions, his playmates, and eventually his co-workers as he reached adulthood. For if Joseph mentored Jesus to be what the Gospels say in Greek is a tekton, that means a craftsman both in wood and stone, he certainly would have also done so for James and Joseph, which means little Joseph, Simon and Jude, who are named by St. Mark as his brothers. Whether we debate the composition of this family from the perspective of history or from a position of piety, it matters not, indeed. The fact remains that Jesus is raised in a family and probably among a large extended one, too, in that the clan that lived in Nazareth were probably related to him, nearly a hundred households of them, most of whom, along with Joseph, prided themselves to have blood from King David's line. As Jesus emerges from the shadows of the hidden years, we are able to conclude that this family, along with all the Nazareans, were observant religious people. 
because Jesus reveals himself to be a most faithful Jew and thus a regular attendee at the synagogue Sabbath services each week and one who participates in the celebration of the major feasts in the Jewish calendar year going actually to the temple in Jerusalem. Furthermore, we know that he can and does read, and so he must have also been educated by the local rabbi in a synagogue school in Nazareth, in addition to being apprenticed to his stepfather in his trade. Yet even though the apocryphal gospels that we often hear about on A&E and other channels written in the second century or later, will try to tell us tales of Jesus at home and at play in Nazareth, these cannot be accepted as reliable at all. So what we can know of those hidden years is limited, but important because we are reminded that even the Son of God had to learn his alphabet and his numbers had to be socialized and acculturated, taught to acquire habits of work, worship, and leisure, all of which were imparted to him in the context of a human family. Thus, we are reminded by that how important the family is in the plan of God for human life and well-being. It is not sacrilegious to suggest that the family of Jesus at Nazareth was unlikely to always have been a perfect family. They must have faced their challenges, their tensions, their disagreements, and their hurts, as do all families, or else they wouldn't really be a truly human family. But we can also be equally certain that they were at the same time an authentically holy family because their life was centered in God. So their hearts were loving and forgiving. And under the authority of Joseph and Mary, their ways were righteous in the technical sense of the word and that they were obedient to the commands found in the Torah. God's covenant. So not as statues neatly arranged in a niche, but as real people living real lives, but carefully keeping themselves rooted in God's ways and obedient to God's laws. They can and should be an example for every family to follow. So today, as we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Family, let us try to renew our deep appreciation for the role of every family. As we look to the wise words on that image of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph that greets us on the walkway that leads to this parking lot entrance to the church. Family, be what you are is inscribed below their image. And in accord with God's design, the family is the place where everything essential is first learned, especially then the lessons of love and the lessons of forgiveness. So we know the only response to that command on the statue can be holy.